Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our public journalism show, The Watchdog. This is a show that asks probing questions on behalf of the citizens of the Republic and holds those with power and influence to account. My name is Vuyo Vogo. Now, parents, teachers, and learners are concerned about the impact the virus could have on teaching and learning in our schools. The question is, will our schools have the capacity to continue to provide educational services from an online platform should the virus spread and schools are forced to close down? Well, our guest tonight uh, is a panel consisting of parents, uh, teachers, but also NGOs that are involved in this space that do a lot of work and know the landscape better than most of us here in South Africa. I'll introduce you um, uh, to them in a short while. But to give you a bit of context, the edu Basic Education Minister will tomorrow afternoon address the nation about the decisions that Cabinet and the National Command Council would have taken around basic education. So we thought that uh, hours before she does that, let's get a sense from the people who are on the ground as to how they feel, their hopes, uh, as well as their aspiration. Now, uh, the first panel to help us do exactly that uh, consists of Tsejo Pala, who is the Executive Director for Equal Education's Law Center. We also have Dr. Anthea Seresto, who is the CEO of the Governing Body Foundation. We also have Unesongo Matikina, who is the provincial chairperson of the caucus in the Eastern Cape, uh, Naptosa. Uh, I mean, we also have Naptosa CEO, I should say, Basil Manuel, um, who is, of course, the uh, person running affairs at that teacher organization. Um, before I get to them, uh, let's play for you a little clip for, from an interview I had with the Director General of the National Department of Health. This is on the day that the President announced that they had decided to take us to uh, level three. I asked the uh, uh, head of department in the health department as to whether cabinet discussed the issue of basic education and what was to happen. This uh, is what he told me on Monday. We do need to try and sustain the schooling. Uh, I mean, there's been a very strong case that has been put forward by the sector that there's been a lot of uh, schooling time lost. Uh, and we don't want, in, at the end of the day, to actually, in the later years, feel the brand of uh, a disrupted education system. But we are trying to balance the issues. And if issues do come up to uh, at a later stage to be problematic, we think that could be managed at that particular time. Of course, there are, there, there are already some uh, measures that have been introduced by the Department of Education. Uh, uh, to, to ensure that there is mitigate, like the cancellation of um, uh, conduct sports uh, and, many, uh, and managing infections with, uh, within schools. So that one uh, was actually uh, discussed, but it was, uh, it's something that uh, was not really uh, going to make much difference if it was implemented. Well, let's hear from our panelists. Now, I'm going to uh, start um, with uh, Naptosa here. Uh, Basil Manuel, uh, having listened to that clip, what the Director General of the National Department of Health said uh, on the day the President uh, uh, took us to Level 3, it would appear that schools are going to stay open. But what would you like to see, if that indeed is what uh, NG Mutsecha, the Minister of Basic Education, is going to tell us tomorrow? Good, good evening, Vuyo. Naptoza has been very clear on what our standpoint is uh, on this matter. First of all, we support a view that says we must keep schools open for as long as possible. However, we've also said to the Minister, it's not a blank check. Certain things must be in place and certain things must be done. Health and safety are paramount. We expressed our concern about the, 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 the chronically um, oversupplied schools where our schools are, are, are splitting at, 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 the, at the seams, where there are so many children per class. So those are the issues that, that we, um, we raised. So we are 
clear that we must be guided by the signs and the signs of the times. And this is what we are looking at now. And when we meet the minister, we will certainly be oh, raising right. it. We're hearing a lot of concerns uh, from people. However, those concerns are sometimes from a place of fear, from a place of anxiety, and may not be based in the reality of the sciences. So we will listen to what uh, is being said. And of course, we will also express those concerns because it's important that the minister also knows the heartbeat of what is happening out there in terms of the, the, the mental health of our members. Because the, the mental health is equally important because fear is real. It doesn't matter what informs it. And so that is where we stand as NAPTOSA. Schools must remain open, provided that all the health and safety measures are in place and we can ensure that everybody is safe or rather not everybody, that, that schools are safe places for everybody. Okay. Um, Dr. Seresto, your thoughts, having looked at uh, what is happening on the ground, having listened to some of the people who bring um, a lot of issues uh, for your attention, do you think that uh, as we get into this uh, third wave of this uh, pandemic, we will, we will be able to do all the necessary things if indeed uh, schools remain open? Right. Well, I agree with uh, Basil Manuel in uh, what he has said. Uh, we have some principles. Safety first, as many school days as possible for all children, because school is good for children, necessary. Otherwise, we're going to have backlog that's going to affect these children for years to come. However, decisions about COVID-19, I don't think can be made um, centrally for the whole country. Uh, COVID is not controlled nationally. COVID is moving through the provinces at different speeds. There are going to be some areas of our country that may, we hope, not even be touched by the waves. Those children should be allowed to go on with schooling. However, we are concerned about what is happening in Gauteng, which is the province which has an extraordinarily high rate of infection at the moment. Every day we are hearing of more learners being sent home during the course of the day, more children going into isolation, more teachers affected. It is actually becoming quite fearful at schools at present in Gauteng. And parents are speaking with their feet they are keeping their children at home. So the teaching and learning that is going on at schools is actually disrupted already now. And do you believe that somehow we need to have this risk adjusted strategy that the minister speaks of frequently, but I think somehow into the system should be brought some flexibility because it may be bad now in Gauteng but in due course, three weeks, I believe, is the proposed sort of time frame. The Western Cape will have the difficulty. By then, maybe it will be better in Gauteng and children will be back in schools, except then it is school holidays. What this is doing, it is causing enormous stress amongst the workers at schools, all workers, all staff and the children. Um, there's just so much that they can cope with when it is the pressure of trying to get work done, school work done, because there is a, an annual teaching plan, although it has been somewhat adjusted, there are still assessments in this plan. There's pressure put on children, there's pressure put on teachers. Um, children are, have, have reportedly been coming to school when they haven't been very well, and who knows what they were ill with. Similarly with teachers who are not sure whether they're ill or not, somehow feel pressurized to go and except we do know we've all been advised and warned, don't go to work if you're not well, don't send your child to school. There are these pressures that are in schools all the time. They don't go away. Also, the accountability demands on schools continue, despite the covered additional demands on schools, of principals, of the management of the school. There are other accountability demands that are going on. So the environment at school at the moment is really stressful. And I'm not really sure how much effective teaching and learning is happening. 
because there's such a lot of difference. In some places, schools are more or less continuing as normal, and they can do so. But in other places, they haven't got back to normal since last year in March. They are still out of school. They still don't have an adequate uh, supply of learning materials when they're away from school. Online learning for the privileged is not really working. And for those who are not privileged, other methods are reaching some children, but not all children. I believe we are in a serious situation at the moment. We are trying to help our schools manage it and to bring some calm, but we've got to think of the balanced risks, the well-being of everybody, dealing with the disease and dealing with the stresses and the trauma that has been associated with this. It's a difficult situation in schools. It's a difficult decision for the Minister of Education. But we would say, let us look at regions and possibly provinces, but I think regions might work even better in certain provinces, which are very large geographically. We, 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 will, look, we, will, we will look at the rest of into what would need to be happen uh, in whatever, given whatever eventuality. But uh, allow me to go to Tseho Pala and bring her in um, here on just what she is hearing. Uh, I mean, as, as equal education, what are you hearing on the ground? Um, what, what kind of environment uh, uh, are we seeing throughout the country now, uh, I mean, within which... Uh, the context within which uh, tomorrow's pronouncements, uh, I mean, will be will be made. Mm. Thank you so much, Vuyo. So I'm from the Equal Education Law Centre, which supports equal education, which is a movement of learners. Um, and I think there's three things which concern us. The first thing is lost time. The reality is starting from the beginning of COVID-19, we've lost a lot of time for the curriculum in South Africa. And we've had the Department of Basic Education in various settings telling us that they think that they will only be able to catch up with the curriculum by 2035. That for us is concerning and we're concerned about the continuation of lost time. The second thing we're concerned about is from last year, the DBE has spoken about a risk adjusted strategy. And the idea was that there wouldn't be a blanket approach to school closures. And in fact, that school closures would be, in, would be informed by where in areas of hotspot, for example, where we speak about Gauteng, et cetera, and that that's the manner in which we would close schools. But what has happened, in fact, is that you've had these blanket school closures, which really have affected continued learning. And so for us, we really would call for a risk adjusted strategy to be applied in order for us not to have a sort of blanket approach. The second thing we're worried about is, or the third thing we're worried about is, is around lost learning time is the effect which closures have, particularly on schools in rural areas and in townships. We're hearing from um, learners from equal education in Limpopo and in Eastern Cape saying that on some days, some learners are only going to school four times a month. Some learners in our country are only going to school four times a term. That is concerning. And so what COVID has done to our education system is that it's just magnified the manner in which South Africa's education system is structured, which is a structure of inequalities, a structure which is still informed by the, the divide of our apartheid legacy and our apartheid system. And what will continue to happen without a risk-adjusted strategy, without a strategy which is mindful of the inequalities which exist in our education system, is that it is those learners in rural and township areas and previously disadvantaged areas who simply won't make it by 2035 to catch up. And so we're concerned about that. And so we really think there's a need for a risk adjusted strategy to be applied. We think there's a need to be mindful of, of how rotation looks like in a township school where overcrowding is already a problem, where infrastructure is already a problem. And COVID needs to be um, approached with the realization of how COVID found our education system. And so in a nutshell, I suppose those are the things, those are our concerns. Um, and we think there needs to be considerations around, um, you know, justice around those issues for us. Okay, now let's talk then about how we could possibly 
um, as together as a nation deal with some of the problems all of you have actually highlighted. And I'm going to uh, start with you, uh, Basil. How then do we address the issue of the mental well-being of uh, our educators throughout the country? Where do we even begin? Well, for your, I think the, the beginning is almost sketched for us already. I believe the, with the advent of the uh, vaccination having landed on our shores, it begins a process of, of stabilizing the fears and, and the, the concerns of teachers. But it's only one measure. Of course, and also uh, a measure we know. We, we all know that we are way behind uh, where we should have been yeah. by now. So, <laughs> you know, that, that, that doesn't... But, but, Vuyo, remember, this is starting in the coming week yes. uh, for, for, for the teacher core. Mm -hmm. Teachers and uh, Naptoza and the other teacher unions, and let me make that very clear, we've never excluded anybody else. We've said it must be the entire uh, teacher world or the education workforce because they are important. And rolling that out begins the first strategy. The second strategy is, of course, to address those chronically overcrowded schools. Now, we put this to the minister before, we've put this to the DG, and we've got to start looking at that because bringing all primary school children back is an absolute essential. Of course, when the idea was conceived, we didn't see the third wave playing out like it is playing out now. And so we've got to look at that too. And we've always said that COVID has brought us to a point where we can't simply make decisions and think that a decision today is good for tomorrow and the next month. You've got to look at it and you've got to adjust wherever necessary. But still, the principle is a positive principle. The principle is an absolute. We've got to get our, our primary school children back. Vuyo, we are sitting with grade twos that can't even read simple sentences. When in grade one, that should have been mastered. And this is a crisis that will carry on. And if children don't master reading and writing in the junior primary, they, they are punished for the entire schooling career. So the second uh, part is that we've got to, to, to look uh, more carefully at those overcrowded schools we, so that we can still practice things like social distancing. We can still have uh, uh, certain measures of, of the PPEs and safety measures, the non-pharmaceutical ones, which are imperative. And then we go further. We've got to address uh, the, the, the backlogs. For too long, we've sat and twiddled our thumbs. Look what happened at the beginning of COVID. By holding out, we certainly achieved a whole lot by now ensuring that many more schools have running water that didn't have. And it shows you that when there's a will and there's a force behind it, it can be done. And I don't want to take anything away from achievements that have been made, but they've been very slow and they've neglected the poorest of the poor. And we know that that is the black child, that is the township child, and we have not fully addressed the problems that are sitting there. We can, we can speak in wonderful terms about online learning, etc. It's a nonsense in the townships. It doesn't exist. Even in the well-heeled mink and manure schools, they will tell you that some of this has been more fantasy than reality. And this is what we've got. We've got to recognize South Africa for what it really is and then begin addressing it. And I believe there's sufficient goodwill for that. Dr. Thanks. Soresto, uh, how, as school governing bodies, um, have you been able to engage... Um, with the national department um, in the same way that Basil says as teacher organizations uh, they have tried to do. Have you engaged with them? And if so, um, how positive are you that if indeed schooling continues, which uh, is uh, what is most likely uh, going to happen, are you, are you, how confident are you that at least you've covered some ground and perhaps what you will have to do now is to keep prodding, keep pushing to make sure that um, they meet at least some, if, if, if not all, of the demands that you're putting on the table. Right, yes. Basil has listed it, so there's almost nothing more to say about what needs to be done. The disparities have been highlighted by equal education, exacerbated by COVID. Those are the realities. 
Yes, school uh, governing bodies are consulted by the Department of Basic Education on a national level. We do meet uh, fairly regularly and we um, receive updates. In fact, tomorrow morning we have a meeting where the minister will uh, speak to us about her plans. But uh, so we do have these at a national level. However, a lot of the implementation is at provincial level. And Basil has said it can be done when there's a will and a determination to do it. And we did see much progress because right through uh, 2020, maybe every week, sometimes every second week, we had a meeting with the department and we had this grid where there was reporting from the provinces on the progress that they had made in terms of delivery of uh, some of the essentials uh, for safety's sake and so on. We had these regular reports. And so there was a lot of pushing and a lot of driving and a lot of reporting that was happening. And so within the province, there had to be accountability for delivery of whatever had to be delivered. Now, I think that's what we have to work on. And this goes right across everything to do with education. The people who have positions, wherever they are, whether in a national department or a provincial department, whatever their position is, they have to do their work with a real will to serve the children of the country. And that's what we need to prioritize, is each person doing it. Sometimes I'm concerned that people are not working in the best interest of the children, for various reasons. There isn't the energy um, that ought to be addressed to certain matters. We don't, don't see the urgency. COVID did in fact make some things urgent and so we saw something. Now we need to keep that momentum going. Of course, this is equal education's field of involvement. I'm now sure they have a lot to report and they monitor these things carefully. But I think if we have everybody who's serving in the education sector, and including, of course, in schools, uh, doing their job as they should be for their children, we will make some progress. It comes to schools as well. We do know schools where they have been reluctant to take back the learners. And in fact, they've chosen to rotate um, less often. And, 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 and so we have children attending school less frequently than it would be possible. And I think the minister is now saying it's compulsory to go back. And you can only not go back when you can prove that your school situation is such that you don't meet the safety requirements. So in other words, there's a kind of negative burden of proof. So instead of um, being able to rotate because that's what you choose, now you must go back unless you can demonstrate that those classrooms are too small, which in many, many cases is perfectly true, but make a plan. We have been amazed at what we've seen in some schools. Um, in, the, uh, in the beginning days of, of, of COVID, um, principals, SGBs were quite enthusiastic in, in some schools and made a plan to help their schools be ready on time and to bring back as many children as possible. There was a real... Um, dynamic uh, movement within the school, with school leaders and parent uh, bodies to get school going for the children. Where there was that will, it worked. Unfortunately, we don't have that in all the schools. And again, sometimes it's because of, of, of capacity, of, of, of capacity, simple over, overburdening school with too much that they just isn't left in the person in order to drive what is necessary to drive. Because everything that's going on in education at the moment is extremely demanding and is taking its toll on people because it's now gone on for a year plus. And so what started as energy has somewhat dissipated. And I think as people talk about it, it's, it's COVID fatigue and it affects everybody, and it's also affecting the schools. There's just so many Saturday and Sunday meetings you can attend, and there are just so many responses by Monday morning that a principal can deliver to the district office. So we need to prioritize what's really important, and that's getting children back in the classroom on as many days as possible, 
and everybody else around must make sure it, the necess necessary things are in place to do it. Help uh, schools come up with ideas. If they are in communities where there are um, church halls or community halls, can we not move some of the teaching into community um, spaces? Um, churches uh, that aren't being able to be used, religious um, um, places which are underused because you can't really use them at present. Can we no. use those spaces in, to, to increase the spaces that schools have? Okay. And, and no. the minister... Tejo? Sorry. Uh, so, sorry, Doc. I mean, Tejo, where before uh, we've found ourselves in similar situations, yes, we haven't had a pandemic um, before, but where um, these things look insurmountable, what... what what, what has it taken, you know, to get the parties to find one another? If a situation like uh, that is the one that is most likely to happen now, where the minister is going to declare that it's compulsory to go to school, but on the ground, as Basil just uh, said, uh, the health and safety issues aren't really attended to. What has it taken in the past to get everybody to find one another, that which... Uh, we can try and replicate, um, I mean, beyond tomorrow? I think collaboration, I think, I think collaboration of all the stakeholders within the education system, realizing that we all come with different expertise, we all come with different experiences. I must pause, in, in, you know, within this discussion to, must, to acknowledge that collaboration is why we got to where we got to as South Africa last year. Some other countries haven't had as, as much learning time as we've had. And so collaboration within civil society, collaboration with government, is very important. But what's going to be very important, I think, is that the risk-adjusted strategy must this year be applied. It must be used. We need to have a differentiated approach to COVID-19. Yeah. And, and, and the string which must run through all our approaches is substantive equality. And substantive equality tells us that we cannot have blanket approaches to any inequalities or any issues in our country. And in order to get justice, we need to be mindful of the rural child. We need to be mindful of the child in a township. We need to be mindful of what not being able to be in a classroom means for many learners in our, in our country. It means not being able to access the national school nutrition program it means not being able to learn and so we need to try and find ways to find a differentiated approach which is mindful to the context of learners in South Africa. Now, Basil you spoke earlier about of course the rollout that is about to start um, of the vaccination program um, of teachers and other civil servants and uh, uh, from the briefing that the health department, the national health department gave in parliament uh, the other day. They said uh, they were almost there. I think uh, GEMS has already appointed a service provider that's going to um, run with this program. In fact, speaking of which, uh, I'm going to ask that we play a little insert that was prepared uh, for us by, by, by one of our colleagues um, in the Eastern Cape, Abongile Yangis, who went along when uh, the province, uh, you know, uh, started uh, dispensing uh, the first jab. T just take a listen. Just now, the MEC Fundile Garda just had his jab with me. I do have MEC. A very good afternoon, a very good morning to you, sir. Um, tell us about the process that will unfold when. 72,000 teachers get um, vaccinated during this period. Yes, good, good, good morning to you and also good morning to the listeners and viewers of the SAPC. We have started a program of vaccination today as per the plan of the provincial government. We are ensuring that we up the game in terms of the campaign and also the publicity to ensure that we diffuse uh, the theories uh, that could uh, detract people from making sure that they vaccinate because in the majority of cases there are so many people that have got their own theories uh, on quite a very scientific matter like this uh, which might create a problem uh, for us as government and also as citizenry of the country. You will remember that vaccination by design uh, will always have its own um, side effects uh, by, by 
by, by design. But what is critically for the provincial government is to ensure that when we have done the vaccinations um, as per the plan, uh, by end of next week, a possible test day, we'll be starting to vaccinate teachers and the workforce of the Department of Education, targeting those that are above uh, 40 years because they are a bit risky in terms of the research that has been made and also in terms of the dose that have arrived in the country. So we must target the risky ones as starting uh, to vaccinate them and proceed with the ones that are below 40 years. Uh, but the entire workforce of the Department of Education the Eastern Cape Education MEC Fundile Garda there. Um, all I wanted to, uh, to really uh, show the Basil was that in certain provinces the program has started in earnest and I would imagine it gives a lot of teachers a great deal of hope. But given the uh, pace you know, of this vaccination program from the time it started a lot of people are worried that it may go, you know, I, I mean the, the rollout of, uh, on public servants uh, and teachers in particular may just take much longer uh, than you know, we are all, we would, we would, all, all of us would want it to, 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 to go. Well, look, I suppose we live and learn. This may be the example that we need to show that we, it can work, it can work better, it can work faster, and we can get to the 300,000 a day that the president has asked for. Uh, that, that may be just the example that we need now. I want to say that even when we had the hiccup with the J&J &J vaccine, the provinces didn't stop preparing. They were, they were told to continue their preparations to ensure that everything is ready for the rollout to start. So I'm very pleased to hear from the Eastern Cape and, of course, the other provinces as well, that they are ready to roll. They're just waiting for the, the vaccines to arrive at their stations and then it's going to be uh, rolled out as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible. Uh, will there be hiccups? I'm sure there will be, but I'm sure that all the planning can't come to naught because so much has gone into this. But more especially, Boyo, I think we have that element of goodwill that sometimes is absent because we look for the problems and we always compare to the problem. Now, I'm saying, let's challenge ourselves to make this work better. As a teacher union, we are saying, come hell or high water, we are going to encourage everybody to, to, to be there. We are saying to the doubters, for heaven's sake, you have been bumped to the front of the queue. Don't miss this chance. This is a once in a million chance. Don't miss it today. Even if you are doubting, go and read a bit of sensible literature. But our own survey, which the Teacher Union Collective has done, the five teacher unions, showed that 75% of teachers are positive. And of course, of the doubters, 15% are sitting on the fence. So we may have more than 80% positive, mm -hmm. which is a huge change from the past. Mm -hmm. And that is what, for me, uh, warms the heart. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is a golden opportunity. Grab it. Grab teachers, it with both education hands. workers, everybody grab it. Right. Dr. Sereso, um, you've been nodding there, and from everything you've said from the start of this program, uh, was pointing us in the same direction as well. All of us all showed us to the will. Yes, indeed, indeed. And uh, we, of course, um, are very pleased that the education sector is being um, given this position in the queue, and um, it's correct. And where we can support, we will. Uh, Basil is a great um, advertisement for positivity. As a, as a senior, I've had mine already. And um, so the collaboration that was spoken about, it's all part of it. We certainly hope that the vaccinations reach the distant ends of our provinces. I yes. know they have plans. We will have meetings, I'm absolutely sure, with the department on a regular basis where they will report to us um, how many vaccines have been delivered to which areas and which provinces. So, so there will be a lot of accountability to make sure that there isn't waste, to make sure that everyone gets vaccinated. And obviously, we want it as widely as possible within the education sector, uh, all the people who work within the school environment, not just the educators. 
because the other workers in the school are just as much at risk. So we wish the department well and all the health providers that are going to be uh, doing what's necessary to deliver this vaccination campaign. Sakhopala, this is what you've been saying, collaboration, 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 and only through that can we win this fight. Um, I suppose on vaccinations, we, we welcome the idea that teachers are going to be vaccinated. We recognize the fact that a large part of our society sits within schools. A large part of our communities feeds into the schooling system. And so it's important that we have vaccines coming to our teachers. We are, however, worried about vaccine literacy and the need for the conversations around vaccine literacy to be had within our schooling system and within our societies and our communities, because that, of course, will be a very big thing that plays a huge impact on on the rollout of vaccines. I've got to thank all three of you for coming through, Dr. Seresto, uh, Mr. Manuel, and Ms. Pala. Thank you very much for coming through this evening. All, of course, stakeholders in the education space, uh, they are hoping for the best. And as you have just heard from all of them, it is only through collaboration and more collaboration that we can win this fight and make sure that our children go back to school safely and get to learn. They are far behind, as the National Department of Health Director General said right at the beginning in the clip that we pay, played you earlier. In a short while, we'll be bringing you the students who will also be going to school to hear what, how they feel about going back to school, the sort of things that they would want to be put in place before the environment can be safe for them to continue with their schooling uh, in the midst of this third wave. That and more coming up in a moment. Welcome back. This is The Watchdog. Basic Education Minister Enji Mutsekha will address us tomorrow to take us through uh, the decisions of uh, the government uh, as we enter the third wave of the coronavirus pandemic. What's going to happen? What are the things that have been put in place? How is health and safety going to be ensured in our schools? Well, joining us now are two students uh, who are leading their respective organization based uh, sorry, Kenneth Mwabelo, I should say, is the acting president of Sadesmo. And we also have Unesongo Matigina, who is the Eastern Cape Provincial Chairperson of the Congress of South, African, uh, of South African Students. Good evening to both of you gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for coming through. I'm going to start with you, Unesongo. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, you know, tell us uh, what you think the minister is going to say tomorrow. All we're trying to do really this evening is to get a sense of how you feel as the nation is confronted by this third wave of the coronavirus um, pandemic. What are your fears? What are your hopes? What are your aspirations? Unasongo? Okay, it seems um, we have a problem with Unasongo's line there. Let me come to you, Kenneth uh, Mwabelo. Uh, how do you feel about everything that is going on now, hours before the Minister of Basic Education tells us what the government has decided around basic education? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, um, Mr. Presenter. Uh, well, the feeling is, well, uncanny. Well, we are edgy and agitated to see how well the minister is going to carry out this thing at this particular time. But what I would like to also indicate is that Sadesmo also takes a note of the shooting of a principal in a Buyani Primary School in Edendale, and it wishes to convey its sympathies to, 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 to the family. Uh, I think we are having different pandemics, and we will always have different pandemics. And we are just, uh, we are just on stand guard. But what we are, we are thinking that the minister should do is to harden, uh, you know, um, 
the restrictive measures of COVID-19 in schools. It can't be that we are having a spiral of COVID-19 cases, related cases in schools. We, we can't accept that. Now, if you had an audience with the minister ahead of, uh, you know, her pronouncements tomorrow, what are the three things that you would urge her not to compromise on? Um, may you please repeat your question again? I'm saying if you, you were to you have an audience with the there? minister ahead of her public pronouncements tomorrow afternoon, what are the three things that you would urge her to not to compromise on? Well, we cannot compromise on education on, on a standpoint. Right. You know... Um, education is one thing that you just can compromise on. And seeing, seeing that um, it is now compromised in so many ways, I think we, we, we should, um, one of the things that must be edged is that she must take into cognizance, uh, you know, the more ability of, uh, or, uh, the more ability of infrastructure that she is having in our schools. Our infrastructure is not working as probably as best as it should, and it should be working at, at, at a level pace in which it, at the highest pace at which it should be working at. Infrastructure is one of those she must fix. Secondary to that, you know, they were having this transport um, programs, you know, your transport to school programs. And I think uh, social distancing, maintaining uh, maintenance of that, as well as your uh, hand sanitization, must start from uh, from those transportation uh, alignment. Uh, at one particular point here in my area, in Gauteng, I just saw a, a bus full of learners. There was no uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, regulatory measures in, uh, in terms of social distancing uh, as as required. So, you know, instead of having one bus to, 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 to one area traveling to the school, let's let, allow her to have at least two buses, if not three buses. It can't be that we have a full capacity of buses at, 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 at um, you know, full capacity of buses for commuting students or learners from one place to another at that level. COVID-19, it, 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 it really exists, this thing. And the other thing that we would like to, to emphasize to her is that particularly on the rotationary measures, you know, now they're having that uh, rotation, rotationary measures of having group A and group B, uh, you know, uh, going to, to, to school on different days. Uh, let's have uh, another, another system that will work better uh, efficiently, you know. It can't be that you have a great one learner who... Uh, whose parents work during the day and tomorrow is expected not to go to school or the other week is expected not to go to school, who will be left with the child if the child does not go back to school? You know, those things are things that I think she has been neglecting in terms of, uh, you know, thinking out, out, outside the box and looking for, for these elements. And those are the things that really would like to, to have an engagement on when should we meet the minister. Kenneth Mobile, I'm going to ask you to hold your thoughts right there. I'm going to bring in my colleague um, here, Mataku Komana, who is our specialist education um, a reporter. Any, what are you hearing? Hours before the basic education minister addresses us about, uh, us about decisions uh, that uh, they would have taken as cabinet, as together with the National Command Council, what are you hearing? Well, what I'm understanding is it doesn't look like we're going to have a blanket approach in terms of the closure of schools. Obviously, there are historical contexts here. You'd understand that there were issues last year, and what has happened last year is also filtering into this academic year, where you see those gaps uh, in terms of the curriculum, what learners are not able, have not been able to get, especially at that foundation phase level, a very important level. You'd understand that South African learners at one point were said to be unable uh, to be functionally, um, to be able to read and write. So with um, the whole COVID-19 last year that happened and the blanket approach on closing schools, that created, I think, an even greater problems. You'd understand 
um, the different muscles in, of, in terms of what schools are able to do in situations, in crisis situations. They're not necessarily able to catch up the same way. There was a curriculum catch up. We haven't seen how far that um, has been carried through into this academic year. And already, you'd also remember that school started a little bit later as well. So to then close down schools, you are literally throwing out almost two years of learning for an entire generation. That is definitely problematic. But you also see parents, some parents want the schools to close, some parents actually understanding to say what then must happen. So I think tomorrow what we're expecting to see is that um, intricate dance, if you want to call it that, where the basic education must then try and come up with a solution. But obviously there are those provisions that say that you can target the hotspots. It's not necessarily everywhere where there's a general problem, but we know that Gauteng is saying that they're going to go and argue their case. Schools here, I mean, last week we had about 3,000 this year. This week we've jumped to about 4.7. Those, those numbers are huge and they're quite worrying. Mm. I mean, you know, our guests earlier uh, from the school governing bodies, from NAPTOSA, as well as Equal Education, were all saying the same thing, that uh, our, our, what we've learned throughout this pandemic is that, yes, we have these problems that often look insurmountable, but whenever there has been a will, the, a way has been found to actually you know, deal with those problems. Do you get a sense that that is also what is foremost in the minds of the of the Ministry of Education and the department? Well, m most definitely. Um, and I think that the biggest thing is we should not compromise an entire generation because life will eventually continue. And these children need to be prepared for, for this world that they're going in into because the world's not going to ask you was there a pandemic in 2020 or 2021 so definitely i think um tomorrow i'm actually also quite interested to see what do they come up with but obviously that special um cem meeting to, um, tomorrow morning that's going to take place the various provinces will be fighting their interests and i think putting their interests forward so we'll be seeing the, the provinces that we know that have had a big number of schools having to close down doing those fumigations because it's also costly and not all schools are, are built to the same they don't have the same um pockets in terms of what they're able to do. So I think it's going to be quite interesting because even the online situation that we had last year, we, I think a lot of schools admitted that they didn't, it didn't really work. Children, the best place for children to be is in the classroom. But um, I think also the, the various stakeholders are saying that this should not come at the expense of children. Mm -hmm. So it will be very interesting what their research ha has shown, but also what the various provinces are going to be fighting for, especially those provinces that have the numbers, your Gauteng, your KwaZulu-Natal, and provinces that also historically have challenges, your Eastern Cape as well as... Um, KwaZulu Natal as well without their numbers, but they're also quite a number, but they're also quite rural. So it'd be quite interesting to see how they manage to play that. Will they continue with um, the, the end of July in terms of opening up all primary schools? But I also having spoken to some few people, it would seem that the biggest challenge seems to be stemming at high schools. Um, what is it going to what's going to happen there in terms of the future of high schools in South Africa? Are we going back to a normal timetable? Are we, you know, going to try uh, I, I'm not sure what way they're actually going to find. <laughs> Okay, let's leave you to go back to the newsroom where, of course, you are preparing um, for that, uh, those pronouncements by the Basic Education Minister tomorrow. Matlago Komane will, of course, be taking us through it all tomorrow morning as we build up um, uh, to that afternoon briefing by the Minister of uh, Basic Education. For now, though, let's continue uh, with that conversation we were trying to have uh, with the students themselves who will be going back to school to hear what they think about what uh, they're about to be exposed to. Let's bring you in here, um, Unesongo Matiginga, hoping that uh, our you know, technical glitches have now been uh, sorted out. How do you feel hours before the education minister addresses the nation about decisions that a cabinet would have taken around schooling? Um, I thank you a lot. Let me take this moment and greet um, the viewers and let me take this moment and greet you and also thanks you a lot uh, for this opportunity. Firstly, um, before the address of the minister, we have to know as to what is going to be the change in our education as the learners. Because we can't say we are going to use the same learning system that we were using in the previous years where COVID-19 was not found. And even in these years, we are going to use the same learning system that was used back then. 
learners now must go and must undergo processes whereby they are given new tablets, they are given new technologies, and they are being introduced into new environments of learning. Environments that will not be only conducive for learning, but will be conducive even for teaching, even for the staff that will be cleaning uh, schools, even for the staff that will be doing some other sorts of things. Because in order for a learner to be fixed, in order for a learner to be a learner fully she or he has to, to, to have a contribution from society. Society has to contribute to what the learner is going to become. Society has to contribute to the grooming and growing of a learner. Then, therefore, the minister has to make a change in the way that we are learning as the, as the learners back at school. The minister has to tell us as to what we are going to do that is different than what we are doing back in the, in the 2019, 2018, and the other years that uh, were, 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 were used for academic purposes. Learners today are discouraged a lot because the environment, the environment of teaching and learning, starting from infrastructure, starting from um, the, 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 the things in terms of classes, in terms of tanks, in terms of sanitation, the PPEs, we have to know as to what is the step of the department going forward. Are they going to bring us new infrastructure? Are they going to bring us new water tanks? Are they going to do something? Because there has to be change. Change that will be bigger than just the change that we've been undergoing as the learners. Education now must be transformed. We must no longer speak about education being transformed. Instead, transformation of education must be implemented fully. It is paramount and very important. It is not an option. It has, it has no choices. We are not giving choices to the minister. We are not giving choices to even the Department of Education as a whole. The, 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 the education system has to change. The education system has to favor the learners, has to favor the views of the learners, has to favor the needs and the wants of the learners. The learners must be at the forefront of every decision that are being taken by the department. Because at some point in time, the learners now are the ones who are learning there, and the learners are the ones who are now the reason as to why education is progressing, the reason as to why education is being distributed into different platforms. Because education today, the education of learners allows societal issues such as unemployment, poverty, to be, to be solved. Because at school, where learners are found, there are teachers who are employed. At school, where learners are found, there are aunties who are employed. At school, where learners are found, there are securities who are employed. Then, therefore, learners must be endowed, learners must be included, and learners must have a say as to how the education of their own, as to how their education will actually be transformed, and as to how the education will actually be changed. We are being faced by okay. real big issues because there is no change in school, there is no actual transformation, there is no actual progress. So, as course, I would like to say that we would like to know as to what the department is going to say, what the department is going to do, and would like to see as to how it is going to implement that. And we are going to stand up for that and to say the department must now implement it before the end of this month or before the end of the year or something. We are going to put a time ending for everything that they have promised the learners. We want to know and we want to be put to the forefront because we are the real people, we are the real reasons, and we are the current affairs. We are the present, and we then therefore have to be provided with okay. all the resources that we need. We cannot keep on okay. now going to school with books. We have to have tablets. Okay, yes. that's where we're going to leave it. Unfortunately, sincere apologies about the technical glitches, gentlemen, um, that uh, both you and us seemed to have. And that's where we're going to leave things uh, for now. Everyone, of course, in the basic education space, parents, teachers, pupils, uh, school governing bodies, everybody looking forward to that. Uh, those pronouncements tomorrow by the Basic Education Minister. That briefing is scheduled to start at 2 o'clock and SABC News will be bringing you all what you need to know. And that's where we're going to leave it um, this evening. Do join us again on Monday. From me, William Voko and the crew, it's a good night and enjoy your weekend.